Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. Today, I am extremely honored to invite Dr. Yendil, an assistant professor in history at SUNY Buffalo. He obtained his first PhD in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at the University of Michigan in 2007. As if that wasn't enough, he went on to get his second PhD in history of science at Harvard University in 2015. He was an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the, Jackman Univers at the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto from 2015 to 16. He specializes in the history of medicine in pre-modern China with particular interest in pharmacology, the history of the body and the senses, religious healing and the global circulation of medical knowledge. His first book, Healing with Poisons, Potent Medicines in Medieval China, was published by the University of Washington Press in 2021. His second book project, which I'm eagerly awaiting, is tentatively titled, Sent from Afar, A Transcultural History of Aromatics in Medieval China, which explores the circulation of aromatics along the Silk Road, the local integration of imported knowledge and the history of smells. And for you guys who know how on fire I am about the volatile biome and the aero biome, you understand why I really can't wait for the second book. So welcome, Dr. Liu. Thank you for having me here. So I have to know, because your book is, I absolutely love this. The only problem that I had was every time I put it down, it was missing because my wife kept stealing it. <laughs> so you both love the book. <laughs> I both loved it. You clearly put a lot of work into this. And what really catches me is that with all of the historic and cultural context that goes into it, this may create some cognitive dissonance with practitioners. And I wanted to ask you first, what are some major misunderstandings that people have about Chinese medicine? Thank you, Andrew, for that question. And so uh, that's really the key question that uh, uh, initially motivated me to write this, this whole book. I developed this book, you know, out of a dissertation. I started working on this project about a decade ago. And at that time, so when I was looking for topics, uh, one of the issues uh, that really, you know, fascinated me is this difference between the historical understanding of Chinese medicine and the contemporary, you know, modern understanding of Chinese medicine by both practitioners and scholars and the, public, the general public. And so that's really good way to actually introduce my book. That is, I try to prioritize some, uh, still I think widely you know, uh, held opinions on Chinese medicine today that is particular comparing Chinese medicine with uh, Western biomedicine, that Chinese medicine is often considered to be natural uh, to be benign uh, and with few or no side effects. By comparison, uh, modern biomedicine is often believed to be more violent, more toxic, um, artificial, and also with plenty of side effects. That's, you know, for people who are sympathetic of uh, Chinese medicine or alternative medicine in general, they find, oh, this is a nice alternative. Right, so uh, a, a nice way of for for, uh, for healing. So, understandably, it is a it is a valid and very different system healing. Right, in many ways, it complements uh, Western biomedicine. But this dichotomy, actually, uh, I consider is problematic because when I you know go back to history, and I think to a certain degree still today, uh, we find a lot of powerful substances used in Chinese medicine, especially Chinese pharmacy. And so that's really the topic of my book, right? Abundant use of poisons used for therapeutic purposes. It's not because of, you know, these things are, are dangerous. Actually, the doctors readily, they were aware of the danger of these substances, but they are also willing to develop, you know, methods and techniques to transform these powerful substances into something useful as heating agents. It's a very robust tradition, but in a sense, it's, it's kind of a forgotten tradition. 
uh, and I want to bring that uh, to uh, the attention of the general public, including the practitioners, to make them aware of this strong tradition. In a sense, we, have, we can have some meaningful conversations, not just about the complex history of Chinese medicine, but also have some meaningful conversation between Chinese medicine and uh, modern biomedicine. I think there's definitely connections as well as differences between the two systems. Absolutely. And along those lines, one of the ideas that really struck me was the amorality of not using appropriate herbal power, right? You, if you're not using dosage and chemically active substances and are kind of just maybe treating the branches a little bit, there is some amorality associated with that. And um, in particular, mm -hmm. see, and uh, Gu Yang Wu at the end of the book mentioned that, you know, in ancient times, people would kill patients by accident, but now people kill patients by not taking those risks. And right. as somebody who is absolutely guilty of this myself, I found <laughs> that, um, I found that aspect of being scolded from, you know, 1695 to be very eye-opening. Yeah. Yeah. So I added that really fascinating quote, uh, in the conclusion part of my book, because Guyan will live in the period of time uh, that's very different from the period I focus on, you know, uh, the first millennium, that's medieval period I focus on. Guyan will live in the Mingqing, you know, period. And so at that time, there's something changed. I mean, still there's a pretty robust tradition of using poisons for healing in China, but also uh, there, uh, there, there's also the abundant use of what we call tonic drugs, you know, like Jimson. Mm -hmm. People use that all the time, not just for curing illness, but also enhancing life. Uh, but there is this concern actually, particularly among doctors and Guyan, although he himself was not a doctor, he was sympathetic that, you know, these doctors were hesitant to use poisons or powerful medicines because they, 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 they were afraid of the responsibility because they were not good enough. So medical accidents could occur and then then they 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 will lost their job, right? So I think to a certain degree we have that concern as well among physicians in our contemporary world. That that's why they 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 decided to use milder drugs. And this is in Guan was own words, right? Leaving the patients half dead and half alive. Mm -hmm. Basically, it doesn't doesn't really cure the patients, but doesn't save their doesn't kill them either, right? So it's it's that that attitude is really what. Guyan was trying to attack, right? So that a good doctor should be able to use poisons in a, in a correct way. It can cure, you know, hard to treat illnesses, right? So they should have that courage to take the responsibility, right? As exactly what you said, Andrew, this morality, the moral principles of doctors, uh, that's very important. Excellent. Now, one thing that really struck me about your book is I love to listen to history. If I'm walking or something, I'm usually listening to great courses. And I love books on uh, pharmacology of herbs and uh, Chinese medicine history. What really caught me was your ability to blend both. Because when I read just from a pure historic perspective, they're talking about maybe herbs. And I'll say, eh, you know, that part's a little bit could require some more nuance. And I've never seen anybody with such a accurate Venn diagram of both of these attributes. So your first PhD was in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Your second was in the history of science. What inspired this transition from science in the lab to more of a historic perspective at Harvard? Yeah. So that is a question that you can imagine has been asked for many times. So it is, a, a, I would say, a, a unconventional uh, trajectory. So having, you know, uh, two PhDs in two very different disciplines. Um, so, uh, so I always love history. I always loved humanities when I was young. And so uh, my first PhD was in biology when I was doing that PhD at the University of Michigan, uh, as you said, I did a lot of lab work. I worked with flies, fruit flies, Drosophila, uh, for quite a few years. Uh, so um, that was cool. But as I get more of that, I find that, you know, there's something more to the scientific research or experimental studies. Uh, there's more to the scientific truth or what we call objectivity. I think what I'm aiming to hear is that, you know, aiming at here is, you know, the cultural elements of science is always there, 
I mean, in the laboratory setting, be it, you know, the judgment of the data, the funding, you know, the human interactions, it's always there. And of course, I don't deny the objectivity or the truth of doing science. But I think we have to contextualize truth in the broader context, whether it's cultural context, social context, human elements there. I just became more and more um, sensitive to that aspect of doing scientific research. And that's, of course, it's not unique to uh, doing you know, Western science uh, because of my own cultural background that originally came from China. I became more interested in what kind of science or medicine or knowledge production in general produced in an entirely different culture system. And what is the logic of doing that kind of different knowledge production in China? And so that's, that made me gradually bring me to, into, the, into the world of doing Chinese science and particular Chinese medicine. And I really find at the moment that was like 15 years ago, I find it's quite interesting moment for me to have this career transition because I find that, you know, when I, re when I read, you know, the medical texts in ancient China, it's actually not just, or primarily not just about you know, technicalities. Of course, there's techniques, there theories, right? So but it's always embedded in a broader culture, be it philosophy, be it religion, be it politics or economy. So very much, I mean, the logic is similar to what we consider with modern science. It's a very different context for sure. That's really fascinating to me, right? Not just understanding the knowledge production itself, but also the broader cultural meanings, right? That particular knowledge was produced. So that's really make me think, oh, this is something I really love, you know, um, and I want to pursue that. And, and as a result, uh, I wanted to combine my expertise in modern science with this uh, new understanding of the history of medicine and science in China. And so I eventually decided to pursue a degree in history of science. And that's, you know, and here's where I am, you know, so. Wow, well, yeah. That, um aspect of cultural context especially is the other part that gets lost when people are just looking pharmacologically without that historic context there's a lot of kind of guesswork and conjecture that can go into it it um, reminds me of the story or the kind of idiom in, in chinese about the guy who marks the side of his boat when he loses the treasure sword right and then yeah without the larger context even Right. Perfect logic can be very foolish without that larger context. And I think that's exactly. Yeah. 10 years is a long time, but um, very important for getting that kind of context. And I love the word context here. Sorry that, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, and that's really what this book is about, right? There is no, no material essence defined whether this is absolute poison or absolute medicine, medicine, context, conditions what is the ultimate use of these substances, right? So that's, yeah, that's just an example from my own work to show mm -hmm. the importance of the context, yeah. And based on this, it seems that in maybe, whether it was historically viewed this way, or at least our current understanding of say, Greco medicine, there is more of a clear delineation of what is a poison and what is a medicine. Like there mm -hmm. are many, citations historically in the West about aconite, but they're not always so contextual or so refined. There's none of that um, poetry-like right. adaptation to right. make it useful. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. And I noticed you used the word uh, du for, which roughly translated as poison, but can you explain perhaps the difference conceptually? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question, Andrew. So, uh, and I like the way you phrase the question, uh, the question starting from sort of the uh, Greco, you know, Roman tradi tradition of uh, medical history in, in the Western world, right? So um, that's one thing, you know, I'm, I'm quite sensitive of this kind of comparative framework, not just comparing contemporary practice of Chinese and Western medicine, but also back in history. Right, mm -hmm. so every tradition has history and history is very dynamic um, and it's not monolithic. And so, and when I, when I did that kind of comparative work, I really find something revealing. That is, um, I mean, it's true that 
in the West, there, there is this long tradition of using poisons as well in, in, in pharmacy, which can be traced back to 2000 years ago by this work called the Materia Medica by the Asclepiades, right? So that's contemporaneous to the Divine Farmer's classic, Chen Roughly same time, these two very important foundational work of pharmacopoeia emerged in two entirely different worlds. I don't think there's obvious evidence of a mutual influence. It's very much like an independent development, but it's very interesting because the genre is very, very similar, right? A collection of drugs, each with specific description of its location, names, and above all medical usage. And so I did a little bit of comparison of these two very important texts in China and in Europe. And I find that actually Dioscorides' work does include the discussion of poisons uh, and does include the use of poisons just similar to the Chinese tradition. But I also find uh, in Dioscorides' work, there are not many, but still there, five or six substances uh, which are believed to have no medicinal values at all. They're used to kill animals, for example, or just a simple warning, don't touch on these substances. It's absolutely dangerous and no medicine, uh, medicinal value. Uh, Wolfsbane, which is one type of aconite, is one of them there. Uh, but in Chinese pharmacopoeia, starting from Shinong Ben Tao Jing, Divine Farmer's Classic, and for all the following, you know, material medical texts, I don't see this, right? So all the substances in it, no matter how poisonous it is, it still have this recognition of its medicinal value. And aconite in this context is very revealing because not just it is included there as a medicine, but it's used as one of the most frequently used medicines, right? So in medieval China, right? One former books in the seventh century or eighth century, actually 10% of the farmers in that book use aconite. So it's quite a striking difference between these two traditions in terms of the attitude and the practice of the use of poisons. Um, and so building upon other scholars work, for example, in the European context, uh, Frederick Gibbs work on the study of poisons in European uh, medicine. And he will argue that from the 13th century on, there is a very clear demarcation of what is poison, what is medicine. In a sense, poison is absolutely bad or ontologically distinct from medicine. And that became more pronounced in the following centuries in Europe and in the early modern period. Really, that's a start of toxicology, which is a different knowledge system compared to the pharmacology, right? And we still have that legacy today in our modern world, in the Western tradition, we have toxicology, we have pharmacology. But in China, actually, precisely because I didn't find that, you know, the exclusion of poisons out of the Chinese pharmacy, and there's no independent tradition of of this toxicology actually, because I would argue toxicology is always folded into the pharmacology. So my argument here is not trying to say China is lacking something that Western society developed early on. Actually, Chinese medicine actually developed a different kind of logic, right? So, and uh, one way I phrase this comparison is that in the Western medicine, uh, they prescribed poisons despite despite of its toxicity, but in Chinese medicine, it's because of it. Mm. They recognize it as something is valuable. It's not something, you know, inherently bad. That's why they readily incorporate that into their pharmacopoeia, right? So that's, I think it's what a comparative study can, can be so revealing. Mm. Interesting. The um, phrase that I've used, or I've heard used to describe, say, Chinese culture versus other cultures, is high context versus low context culture. I'm not sure how popular this idea is, but um, generally the more absolute one-to-one -one something is, the lower the context culture it is. And China is considered to have the highest context culture. So we don't necessarily have herbs that are, as you're saying, not like God or devil herbs, just chemically active herbs. And the context itself will determine how they're used. And maybe all of those uses are correct so long as they're appropriate right that's an interesting you know term right high and low context to differentiate different cultures healing cultures yeah there's also a concept of um, using poisons to fight poisons mm -hmm. and the yeah. um 
use of poisons to expel what maybe today we would consider parasites, and perhaps there's overlap with evil spirits as well. So traditionally, there's a concept of uh, gu. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, yeah. So that's a fascinating question. I uh, devoted a chapter in my book to discuss this. Uh, and idugundu, this term, use poison to attack poison. Many people are familiar with it, even if uh, even if it's out of the medical context. I think it's 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 one of the, the very popular sayings uh, today. And but it is originally out of a medical context, or say you know, and it is it is about the logic or rationale of using poison, right? So that's one thing people tend to ask, right? Why do people use poisons in the past in China? What is the underlying principle? And this is one prominent principle in the period I study in the first millennium of Chinese history, that people consider that you use powerful substances like poisons to attack a pathological entity or entities inside the body that a mild drug wouldn't work. So, I mean, they used the, literally used the word uh, hit to strike, right? So uh, to strike that and to destroy it, either to destroy it or to eliminate it, to expel it out of the body. Um, and of course, people at time live in a different world. Uh, they have a different kind of idea of what these uh, diseases are, right? In a modern you know, context, we can just say, oh, this is bacteria or germ or parasites. Uh, they didn't have a concept of bacteria. They do have some kind of concept related to parasites, which is worms, right? So, uh, or worm-like creatures, they invaded body uh, from, sometimes they invaded body from outside, from nature. Sometimes they, they, they grow up together with the human body. It became an inherent part of the human body. Mm -hmm. So either way, these are bad things. They are detrimental to health and a variety of ways, either by physicians at the time or Taoist masters, they use different approaches. Taoist masters tend to use ritual approaches, incantation, spells, for example. And then doctors in the past tend to use these kind of powerful medicines or poisons to strike them, to destroy, to destroy them, and, and to, to, to cure illness. So that's the a prominent uh, etiology the cause of illness and the corresponding therapy at the time, the, the, the idea of Yidu Gongdu. And I want to say a few more words on uh, this concept of Gu, which is related to worms, right? So that you know, one way of preparing Gu poison is basically put a bunch of poisons worm together and let them freely devour each other. Mm -hmm. And eventually there's one left and that becomes the king or queen of the poison. And that one can be super harmful to people. And so uh, that's one connection to worm, but I think it's a very uh, mysterious concept as well. I mean, there is a material basis like that, but there is also a, a strong association with, with magic and, and witchcraft. So um, it's really hard to nail down what Gu really is for us. And it was even, uh, it was very hard for the people at the time to figure out what it is because this 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 this, um, this uh, associate, association with, with magic. And I would say people at the time tend to use this concept of qi to uh, describe gu, but not qi circulating inside the body. It's basically is a pathological qi emanated by the gu, those who prepare gu poison, right? So, and that qi actually can act over distance. Right, so it's not just about mixing meals with some poisons and kill people. There is some kind of, uh, you know, long distance effects on this. So, in my book, I I, I focus on the seventh and eighth century to talk about gu poison, uh, what gu poison was, but also very importantly, what were the people's response to this? And there's physicians' response using the idea, as you said, use poison to, con uh, to fight, uh, to attack poison, to get rid of these worms out of the body. But also there's very strong political response because they, their re rationale is that, you know, like physicians, they want to cure the body of the country, 
by get rid of not just the gu, gu poison, but also the people who prepare gu. Mm. Right? Oftentimes it's accusation. There's no clear evidence. These people actually prepare gu, but they accuse these people often of lower social or uh, origin. And they are also tend to women. That's why I use the word witchcraft. And so, uh, and we know that there is a long history of witchcraft persecution in the Western world. And so this is something somewhat similar that there is a persecution of these people accused of preparing gu and making them, banish them to the margin of the empire. Uh, so I find that parallel is very interesting, just like physicians use of powerful drugs mm -hmm. or poisons to strike gu. Uh, governments implemented powerful policies to get rid of the gu uh, uh, preparers. So, um, so that's another way, uh, I mean, when I think about the medicine and culture, and in this case it's political culture, actually there's some quite interesting resonance uh, we can see there. Yeah, almost a holographic resonance where people are taking the cultural approaches toward medicine to the government as well, governmental right. level. And there are obviously so many analogies when it comes to medicine that have to do with governance and citing those, you know, um, Han Dynasty and Warring States kind of classics on governance and ruling as it applies to medicine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the so-called the body politic, this mm. idea, right? So, yeah. Excellent. Um, you cite different goals in Chinese medicine from healing acute disease to moderating chronic conditions. And then finally, as life enhancement for improving brain function in the pursuit of enlightenment or other Taoist practices, what role did poisons have in these various categories? I know it's a huge question, obviously, you know, yeah. Cliff Notes version. But yeah, that's, you know, uh, that's a good question. And it's really uh, covers, give a sort of uh, panoramic view of my book. In my introduction, I give a, 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 a diagram, actually. Uh, you mentioned the three dimensions, which corresponds to the three uh, yeah. layer of the uh, different uh, the hierarchy of the drugs in the Divine Farmers Classic. You have a curing disease at the bottom, and then you have uh, the prevention, disease prevention, strength in the body that's in the middle, and then the the top part is it's basically uh, enhancing life, if not immortality, right? So it's it's work in the continuum. And poison operated uh, in all these different levels, although you see that in the pharmacological writings, poison are concentrated in the, the bottom level, to cure disease. And that's the foundation, right? The use poison to attack poison, it's a good example to show. It does cure, you know, it seeks to cure these obdurate diseases inside the body. And the first so five chapters of my book really focus on how that worked principle, the political implications of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's one dimension, the Idugundu dimension of using poison to cure disease. But that's not the only one because there is a higher pursuit of the vitality of the body, both by physicians and religious practitioner at the time, right? So you being not sick is not enough. You want to live longer. You want to have more vitality. So here I really see the entwined relationship between medicine and the religion, both Taoists and the Buddhist religion. And as we see them very distinct in today's world, back then actually they are more entwined. They have this shared goal. Perhaps they have different approaches to achieve that goal, but the, goal, the goals are shared. And so in, the, in, in, in this aspect of life enhancement or, or alteration of the mind, you know, or achieve certain kind of enlightenment, or actually it's, I guess, enlightenment in the sense of illuminating of the mind. Uh, in the last two chapters, I, I discussed extensively, for example, in the case of ingesting uh, the so-called five stone powder, which is a compound drug, including mineral poisons like arsenic. And people at that time was really enthusiastic about this drug, especially among the elite circle. And they, uh, they consume the drug passionately and not just 
to strengthen the body, but also illuminate the mind because they are literati. They want to write beautiful poetry, for example. And so they find this drug have some kind of effects on their mind that at least temporarily make them feel, you know, happy or just illuminated so they can write beautiful poetry, for example. So, and of course, a lot of people use this drug mistakenly and then tragic followed. And so, and there's a lot of records of people died from ingesting this drug. But my point here is that um, it's not because of the drug is inherently bad. Uh, like, you know, some scholars compare the drug with uh, opium, for example, that become a very prominent example in the recent history in China, right? So, um, but when we look at the texts and discussions back in medieval China, the majority of people really say that, okay, it's not really about the inherent harm of this drug can bring. It's more about the mishandling of the drug. That's really called the problem. Again, this issue of context matters quite a lot that, you know, because this drug can produce a lot of heat out of body, then uh, you need to do certain things, eat cold food, take cold baths, uh, work, a uh, walk with a little clothes. It sounds strange, but that's what people did at the time to kind of release the heat produced by the drug in order to achieve the best effect. Not everybody followed that. Not everybody followed the, the right dosage suggested by doctors, et cetera, et cetera. That make a lot of tragedies. So that's really, I think, uh, again, hitting the, uh, the, the central argument of my book that, you know, either in the case of curing illness or in the case of life enhancement, context matters quite a lot. Excellent. Yeah, I remember this is the opposite end of the spectrum as academia, but as a kid, I would read these kind of um, Kung Fu comic books, right? And people would take elixirs and one guy had to bury himself in the sand because his body was producing so much heat and he had to get all of the heat off of himself. And there's kind of an idea of um, using that to get rid of poisons in the body so he could get to the next level. And just from kind of a modern biological point of view, I have to wonder about the countryside in China and how fatigued people might have felt because of worms or other pathogens. And then you take some time to literally expel those worms and then your brain function goes up because you're not getting eaten by tapeworms. I, right. Maybe that's a simplistic way of looking at it, but I think that... Um, you know, even as we look at the gut brain axis and everything else, it kind of, it kind of lights me up because I think that um, even though maybe if I'm looking through the vantage point of what we currently have for research, it's still perhaps limited, but it is interesting to see these connections um, being formed. Anyway, I think that's exciting. Thank you for sharing that story, actually. So <laughs> yeah, the heat production, uh, especially mineral drugs, um, both in the context of this powder and in the context of elixirs, uh, as you mentioned, uh, that's a very, very uh, important uh, marker of oftentimes by the actors I investigated back in medieval China, they, uh, they use that as a very important marker to show the effects of the drugs, right? So it got to have this kind of effects, sometimes very violent effects on the body and then the proper channeling of the heat, the heat out of the body uh, become a crucial step for, uh, for the, the drug to be effective. So, I mean, the lesson here is really interesting that, you know, today when we take drugs, we, uh, we follow doctor's advice and we take it and, 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 and we see, we, we hope that symptoms will disappear, that the disease will be cured. Uh, uh, but it seemed to me that back in immediate China, patients would take more responsibility because taking the drug, like ingesting the drug is just the first step. After that, you need to do things actually mm. is to channel the heat out of the body, follow proper you know, uh, rituals, for example, and, and you, you need to you know, act on it, right? So, and so the responsibility of that kind of things now in the modern world is more or less controlled by the doctors, not by the patient. Patients become more in the sense of, say, passive and compliant. Uh, 
So that's that's something I find is quite interesting. We can we can learn from the past that how the patient themselves can take responsibility. Of course, we are not experts. We need to listen to doctor, but there is a space as negotiated by the bodily sensations, bodily experiences that we can monitor and we can you know contribute to uh, the ultimate result of the therapeutic you know uh, effects. There's a section you spoke about in Healing with Poisons about a kind of medicinal pill for getting pregnant. And the directions kind of speak to determining how you feel to determine whether you can continue with the tonic or not. And just how different that is, that the patients had that contextual understanding. If I have too much of a tonic, maybe I feel too much heat. Maybe they understand what that means. Perhaps today we could look at that as signs of inflammation, then they would tone it back or not. And um, having practiced medicine in China and in the West, that's a huge difference because in China, people will just, they'll say, oh, I had too much and this happened. So I toned it down and now I feel great. But oftentimes the same situation, same dosage for somebody in a Western country, they'll say, well, I took it for three days and then it hurt me. Okay. Uh, did you? adjust yourself at all? No. Okay. That was my fault. You should have come back earlier. Right. So definite difference with the way people view medicine. Right. Yeah. That's a really interesting example. Yeah. So, uh, Gu Hong, when I was last in Sichuan, uh, I was supposedly in the area where he was from, you know, the local village has a big statue of him. He's like this figurehead of self-cultivation. So today people, you know, think the health and wellness industry is new, but really, you know, people like him were kind of starting it a long time ago. And um, he said that elixirs were actually the best method for transcendence. So if you're sitting, meditating, trying to think happy thoughts or think nothing at all, that's good, but it's not as good as taking drugs. What was he taking? <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> right, right. So poisons, right? So the short answer, right? So uh, it is very famous. Uh, I mean, I mean when he, I don't think he was that famous uh, during his time, I would mm -hmm. say. So he became more famous uh, in a, about two centuries after his death and, and even more so today. And I don't know, you know, so whether you know to, to Yu's uh, Nobel Prize uh, uh, achievement, uh, she openly acknowledged the Gu Hong mm -hmm. because one of the farmers in Gu Hong's former collection, uh, used the artemisia this drug, and then eventually to you, you isolate artemisinin from that to treat malaria. That's, that's why she won up by prize in 2015. So that, that's a different story. Uh, Go Hong was uh, both a medical compiler and then also a religious practitioner, a Taoist practitioner. I, I, would say, I wouldn't say Taoist, but basically he has the religious goal or but especially connected to alchemy, uh, alchemy. So, um, and he wrote this very influential book called the Bao Pu, Bao Pu Zi, right? The master who embraced simplicity uh, in early fourth century, where he, he laid out this elaborate conceptual framework of doing alchemy. And you are right, he considered taking the so-called big drugs. Uh, big drug is the best way to achieve transcendence. That's the, you know, the transcending your body to a, a higher state of being. Uh, it's another way to think about immortality at the time, um, to become deity, right? So becoming immortal in a sense. So, and he, he openly says that, you know, taking these so-called big drugs uh, is, is the best way. And these are primarily minerals upon alchemical preparations. Uh, uh, and eventually you produce an elixir and you adjust an elixir, uh, supposedly you achieve transcendence. And that uh, in terms of the ingredients, one prominent poison used in that is, is cinnabar, which is the mercury compound. And we know cinnabar and mercury, particularly mercury is, is toxic in our eyes, uh, but they have different interpretations. Um, so, uh, in Ge Hong's world, actually, his interpretation is, is very interesting transfer of what we call materiality that, you know, 
cinnabar and gold, these kind of things are very robust. Once you inject these robust minerals, the material robustness of these substances, substances can easily or readily transfer to your body, make your body seemingly robust. But of course, we live in a very different world. That kind of interpretation wouldn't make too much sense to us, but that's how Ge Hong perceived the material robustness of these minerals. Right? So they, he considered that much better than taking herbs. It's almost opposite to what we do today, right? We can say herb is more natural, but he considered minerals better. Uh, but I want to say something about um, life cultivation uh, or yangsheng, uh, nourishing life, right? So it's very, very important tradition um, in, in China. I, I, admittedly, that tradition doesn't involve a lot of ingestion of poisons. I mean, that would be very problematic, you know. Um, Ge Hong was very into the yangsheng, you know, the life cultivation. And so uh, he actually, when he talked about the, I mean, he talked quite a lot about the preparation of alchemical products. And he talked a little bit about the ingestion of these elixirs. And he, he was careful that, you know, so even if this is the best drug, that people should uh, be cautious. And his word is that people should have a robust body first before they should start to take these powerful elixirs. And that building of that robust body involves, you know, exercising, it involves dietary regulation, it involves meditation, uh, involves this kind of pulling and guiding practice of bodily exercise, all these kinds of things, he would say, and also there is a moral dimension as well, right? So to be a good person, so all this is a proportional stage, proportional practices. And once, one, once a person is done with that, eventually they will take the elixir to uh, achieve the next state of the being. So you can see that uh, we don't have evidence of Ge Hong himself very you know, quickly ingest any of the elixirs uh, because his rationale here is that you need to build up a body and uh, oftentimes it's, it's a lifelong pursuit of a, a person. And so that's something I want to, uh, I want to lay out the, the, the connection between the alchemical practice and this is more kind of daily life cultivation uh, practice uh, at the time. Excellent. Now, something recently I saw was uh, about medicinal mushrooms and one of the functions of how the body may interpret it is the body goes, Oh God, it's a mushroom. Knowing that so many mushrooms on the planet are poisonous creates a small inflammatory action and getting inflammation at a sweet spot is important for neurogenesis and um, getting kind of a sweet spot of gazotransmitters like nitric oxide. So when I am looking at some of the practices that uh, Go Hong was participating in and the use of poisons, kind of as you mentioned at the beginning, it's uh, poison is a scary word, but if we look at even so-called medicines are causing these inflammatory reactions that are essential for the body, then the more robust someone is, the more robust the medicines that they can take. Yeah, so that is really a good point connecting to back uh, again, the, the issue of context, but in this case is the bodily constitution, right? So doctors pack in the media of China they are fully aware of that uh, a, a, a same medicine or poison <laughs> could have very different effects on different people. Depends on gender, age, uh, mental status, or like location, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Sun Simiao, for example, the famous you know, seventh century Tang physician, he prescribed medicines, different kinds of medicines for, I mean, for women, for the elderly, and sometimes he give very specific guidelines or instructions on uh, at which stage of the life should one take a uh, certain medicine. If this kind of guideline is ignored, and of course there will be problems. So that I think uh, speak quite a lot to what you just said, right? This kind of uh, you know modern parlance individualized medicine. I think that's there's no 
in a universal panacea for everybody, unfortunately, we have to take that individual, you know, constitution of the body uh, into consideration mm -hmm. when we prescribe either poison or medicine, right? Yeah. Now, I read this book. Um, I'm probably through it now one and a half times. It is incredibly accessible for somebody who's not a practitioner and it's very dense with information in a way that doesn't feel dense. So I can open this up and in half a page get more content than I would from a maybe a, a general book on Chinese medicine history. There's just a lot in here, but it's, it's very smooth. And when I look at a book like this, it's clear that it took you the 10 years. I mean, this is, this is really incredible that it is able to achieve both. How many revisions did this take? I can only imagine. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first, thank you so much, Andrew, for your very, very kind words. I I'm very glad, you know, uh, uh, you find the book so accessible. Uh, I mean, admittedly, it is a scholarly book. Uh, I have, you know, endnotes, bibliography, you know, scholarly conversation there. So uh, that's part of my identity as a historian of medicine. Uh, yeah, yeah. If so the there's 40% of the book is, <laughs> right. is referenced. It's there, yeah. right? That's, that's sort of the what my training is. Uh, but but I am, I'm a scholar who has been always been aware of making my writing, not just book, but articles, you know, writings accessible. Uh, I mean, partly because my identity is somewhat different as we discussed before, I have this science background um, and now I'm, I'm a historian of science. So from the very beginning, I always want to, to be a communicator. Uh, between different disciplines, between different group of people. This includes, you know, scientists, historians, but also, you know, practitioners and teachers and the general public. So I think that's really something it's, it's fundamental to me as a scholar to reach out to the broader world. And that's, that's how I make the, I, I try my best to make it as, as accessible as, as I can. And, um, and this book, uh, you're, you're right, you know, it has been subject to multiple revisions. I'll say two major revisions, just the whole book, you know, so from dissertation to the book manuscript and then uh, and then, so uh, uh, a revision of the book manuscript, two major revisions of the overall uh, book. And then many more revisions of the individual chapters uh, for sure. So, um, and make it more concise, make it more accurate, uh, make it more accessible in a sense. So, and I, um, I do learn quite a lot from this uh, process, um, both as a scholar and as a, a writer, I would say, you know, so, and so I make the structure of the book compared to early versions, I make the structure book more, I hope more easy to grasp. So, I mean, on the one hand, each chapter could be self-contained. I start with the, with the episode, uh, a story that's usually a historian's trick, uh, a story to hook the audience or the reader. And then and I discuss the particular topic, like use poison to fight poison, for example. Mm -hmm. And then and I concluded with something broader. I would say not just history, but also, you know, uh, the relevance of that concept, be it, you know, for example, the side effects, what does it mean, you know, in a historical context and how that relate to our modern uh, understanding. So, and that's the, so every chapter is self-contained. You can read any one you like, you know, and then, but there is a trajectory, general trajectory that, you know, uh, dividing the book into the three units. The first two units are more chronological, right, from the third century to the roughly eighth century. It's a very important moment of Chinese pharmacology, the moment we're using poisons. So I want to give the reader a sense that Chinese history is not unchanging monolithic. It's very dynamic. There's a lot of changes from the third to the, to the eighth century. And you see that in the first two units. And then the last unit in relationship to the first two is actually is more conceptual and thematic, right? Moving from as we mentioned before, curing illness to the enhancement of life. And that's sort of follow our, I mean, people in the past and our pursuit. We start with the foundational goal of not getting sick, 
but we also want to go to this higher state of being more healthy, right? So, um, and I and 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 I conclude my book and, um, with some kind of contemporary reflections on this, not just on, I mean, how my book could inform our or or revise our modern understanding of Chinese medicine, but also Western medicine as well, as you said, right? So for anything we ingest, whether it's ginseng or whether it's vitamin, whether it's you know aconite or or it's chemotherapy, I think you know we introduce something foreign to our body. No matter what we call them, we introduce something foreign to our body. So in a broad sense, it's poison actually. And so a, a, a substance potential of harming and healing is always entwined. Again, no matter how we call those substances, right? So it's always entwined. It's ultimately not the substance itself, but how we use it, right? The, the techniques we in introduce, how we experience it by the individual body and how we assign the particular meanings in our society, in a particular culture. That is what truly matters, right? So that's really the, something I want to share with, with, with my readers. Excellent. Now, um, I'll, I'll just share a very brief story. I used to give talks on Chinese medicine to groups of MDs. And I had, especially 10 years ago, I had some very tough crowds and people would say, oh, this is nonsense. This is pseudoscience. So I just started off by saying, is, who here thinks that this is fake? Many people would raise their hands. I said, okay, write me as a beneficiary on your insurance. I will take a poison. You take a poison. I'll take the antidote. Who here now thinks it's fake? All the hands went down. So actually in looking at, if we want to present Chinese medicine as it's always good, it's just good. It won't harm you at all. You know, as you said, it's a double-edged sword, right? So I, from a pharmacological point of view, that's marketing, that's mythology, that's nonsense. Now, the way the I, herbs are combined very intelligently, they are able to take away some of the side effects, but not all. So one of the ways to actually highlight the power of Chinese medicine is to really zero in on that part which people are afraid of, which is the poisonous aspect. The fact that some of the medicine was so-called medicine was developed in wartime combining for poisons. This is the same information. So I think it's really interesting that in zeroing in on what many people would maybe think the darker aspect of Chinese medicine, it actually does a lot of yeah. illumination yeah. for the uh, power and potential <laughs> right. of Chinese medicine. So it I, has I really a black cover that. there. It has a black yeah, cover. It, it does. <laughs> and it's, uh, dark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is also really great cover design, by the way. It, Thank it feels you. nice too. What is that? It's like yeah. rubber. It feels really nice. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I think this is really fascinating that you chose to focus so much on poison like as the foundation. And then um, I want to ask you in a second about your uh, the work you're on right now about aromatics, because uh, that's fascinating. But before, I, what do you hope Chinese medicine practitioners and students take away from this work? Yeah, yeah, good question, Andrew. So the take home message is, um, so I would like to uh, uh, share with uh, uh, my readers and audience uh, two key messages uh, out of this book. And, and the first one, actually, I, I already talked about it, you know, this, this very blurred boundary between poisons and medicines, right? So um, there's no categorical distinction between the two in, in the past, and we shouldn't. Uh, in our contemporary world, really, um, we can we should at least prioritize certain categorizations. There are specific goals for those categories, uh, the divisional categorization. We should which should open up a space to think about the, the, the both the healing and the harming potential of any substance, no matter how benign we consider it before, no matter how toxic or harmful we consider it before. We should have that mentality of the usefulness of all substances in nature mm -hmm. and the, very importantly, the transformative potential of everything in our nature. There's no fixed essence and changing essence of anything. It's always subject to transformation. And no matter what kind of transformation you, 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 you interpret, right? So technical transformation, body transformation, 
uh, you know, transmission in the social space. So that's something, you know, I want to share with my audience, my readers, this sense of fluidity of medicinal substances. Um, and really responding to, for example, in our modern concept, you know, especially in the biomedicine, right? So this idea of active ingredient, right? So active, active ingredient definitely have this valid aspect, but it's also limited. It is a really reductionist approach to understanding medicines, right? There is a core there, chemical core and changing core that is responsible for the cure. And as I have repeatedly mentioned, right? So actually that core is only part of the healing. The context, the transformation potential of the substance, I mean, including the core, but not limited to that core, matters quite a lot, right? I want people to reconsider this concept of active ingredient and go beyond that, actually, to incorporate this variety of factors that will contribute to the therapeutic outcome. That's my first uh, uh, lesson. Uh, the second lesson is more related to uh, a concept uh, you also mentioned uh, just now, the side effect. Right? So when I initially prioritized the misconceived dichotomy between Chinese and Western medicine, uh, I tend to say, oh, originally people wouldn't consider Chinese medicine would induce side effects. Now you introduce poisons to my attention, okay, then Chinese medicine does have side effects. Uh, I mean, to a certain degree, I would say, yes, if it's used wrongly, definitely it have side effects. There's no doubt about it, just like Western medicine, right? Mm -hmm. But I also want to go beyond that to again, just like the practice or exercise interrogating the concept, concept of active ingredient, I also want to invite you to interrogate the concept of side effects because side effects, it's also a Western concept mm -hmm. and you know, originated from the early 20th century. You have the uh, good effects, you have the side effects and there's a demarcation. You want to maximize the former and minimize the later, later right? So that is the rationale. For the period I study, at least in Chinese medicine, there was no such concept. Actually. Just effects. Just the effects. Of course, they are aware of the effects of, of all kinds, whether it's good effects, bad effects, but they focus on the effects itself. And I mean, of course, they are aware of the harms of poison could, you know, cause to the body, but they often attribute the harm to the uh, mismanagement of the po uh, of medicine or improper preparation or improper usage of the medicine that will cause the effect rather than that is the inevitable part of the medicine's effects. And that implicates if a medicine is used properly, the effects, it's a good effect. Even sometimes the effects could be, for example, a violent bodily sensations like vomiting or bodily pain, but it is part of the healing actually. And that is something, uh, this is the last point I want to share with uh, my audience, derived from the second point on side effect is that I want to remind my audience, my, my readers, the important message of healing is a procedure, it's processual, it's dynamic. It's not one step for all, static process of curing disease. It's a process that you have this body experience elicited by the poison, by the medicine. And then again, the patient need to be aware of that. The patient need to take responsibility of handling that body sensation. Of course, if that you know, sensation lasts for a long time, that could be pathological, but temporarily, oftentimes doctor back then would say, this is a necessary step of healing the disease, uh, healing the body and purify the body out of the harmful burdens, right? So that I think it's the message, right? Healing is processual and dynamic. I want to share with, with my readers, yeah. Excellent, that definitely gets lost in translation historically and culturally. So I'm really very thankful for the decade of work that you've put into this. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's you've really raised the bar, which is both beautiful and annoying. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is really wonderful. Now, something that just really has caught my attention, as I mentioned, poison. If you're looking at poison, 
you're really illuminating the power of Chinese medicine historically and its potential, not in the present, but in the future as well. Especially once we get over the illusion that something that is a mineral or something that is even like a Western medicine that has effects on the body must be bad. If we get over these naturalistic kind of um, noble savage, if we, if we get rid of some of these logical fallacies that prevent us from seeing Chinese medicine accurately, I believe that this is not only illuminating history, but really creates a foundation for true integration, not just saying like ginsanocides exist, but using Chinese medicine thought process to interpret um, the plateaus that have occurred in Western medicine. And I'm thinking in particular about the relationship between gut microbiota, the microbiomes in the body, and the relationship between gut bacteria and volatile oils. And not just volatile oils, but I should say the gaseous relationship between all living things in their environment, which kind of takes us to the work you're working on, which is about aromatic herbs and the history of scent and fragrance. Because now, this is just my hope. I, this is where I see it kind of drawing together is I think using electronic noses, yeah. we could actually determine, read people's chi in a very physical sense, be able to read people's chi and determine not what uh, bacteria are there, but based on their metabolites, how active they are just by scent, which is a traditional Chinese medical way of diagnosis. But anyway, I, I'm very excited about electronic sniffers and the role of <laughs> scent in medicine, which is just Anyway, I'm, I'm really fascinated for your next book as well. I know you're working on it. I know you probably can't tip your hand too much on it, but um, what inspired this? And uh, I, yeah, what, when, yeah. when is it coming out? Uh, do I have to wait 10 years uh, for this next one? I hope, I hope not. I hope the second <laughs> one would be faster. I've become, I've become, I've become more experienced writing books. And so uh, uh, really, I, 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 I don't think it would take that long. And thank you so much for your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> about this book, uh, book project at this point. And um, that, that project actually is inevitably derived from my first project on poisons uh, because um, aromatics were often used as antidotes uh, because they can emit this fragrant smells or odors uh, that can dispel the, you know, uh, the poisonous entities in the environment uh, or, or inside the body. So that's the initial connection, right? It's almost like an yin and yang pair here. You have poison medicine, uh, a poison aromatic as yin and yang as you know, something treat poison, right? So uh, aromatic. So that's the starting point. And when I get more into it, I do find uh, you're right that you know, physicians pay attention to, uh, to smell, not as early as taste, right? You know, taste, that's you know, foundational in Divine Farmer's classic. Taste is one of the drug properties. Right, so uh, odor, smell, gradually uh, got into the medical treatises in the Tang period from the seventh, eighth century. People started to talk about uh, the taste, of, uh, the, the smell of the of the medicines, and as a marker of medicines therapeutic potential, and that become more pronounced in the the following century. So I probably will move to 12th, 13th century to elaborate that you know that's a very significant development uh, in medicine right as, as a, adding a new dimension to evaluate uh, the therapeutic potential of, of drugs so that dimension i'm very interested in uh, but also beyond that i find many of these aromatics you probably know this are not originally uh, uh, from china actually they're imported because the natural habitats is in southeast asia is in india sometimes uh, in central asia so and there is this interesting process, right? So they, in this is in that sense, it's more a, 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 of an ambitious project to to explore this trans culture uh, transmission of knowledge of uh, aromatics and olfactory knowledge associated with them, medical knowledge, because in their original culture, for example, Indian culture, definitely these substances were used for healing purposes, uh, curing diseases. And then once those knowledge migrated to China and there is an indigenous medical system here, and there is this very interesting process of negotiation, right? So how you take into this foreign knowledge of smell or medicine or aromatics and make to your own usage, 
And that, I mean, that's another kind of transformation. Speaking of transformation, is transformation between different cultures. Mm -hmm. And now I find it's fascinating to, to explore that. And finally, smells also figures very uh, prominently in the religious rituals, particularly in the Buddhist rituals, they, uh, they make incense out of it, right? So, and that smell uh, oftentimes is a way they communicate with higher deities. So that, again, speaks to this uh, topic of bodily experiences. In this case, it's olfactory experiences, how that contribute or enhance the bodily experience of, of the devoted and, 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 and contribute to the ultimate healing effect. It's something I, I'm very interested. In. So it's still in the starting stage, um, I don't know, four or five years from now, I hope it can be another book, mm -hmm. but uh, that's the goal. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very excited about the project. That's wonderful. I'm particularly inspired by how it can bring people together because there is so much overlap between Greco-Arabic and Indian and Persian medicine that is even to African medicine and how, and you know, as you mentioned through Indonesia, how that's influenced Chinese medicine. And it's in past dynasties, it has been very cosmopolitan, especially like the Tang dynasty, very cosmopolitan, more than we think of even modern China today. So I think that that um, is a really wonderful area of exploration, especially as the One Belt, One Road kind of continues to open up infrastructure through Central Asia. I hope it's an area that can bring increased friendship and cooperation. Right. So sort of the medicines on the Silk Road, right? So it's, right. it's a very exciting uh, uh, dimension uh, of study medicine. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Uh, for all the listeners, I just want to mention, if you are associated with the Chinese Medicine School, I just bought Healing with Poisons for you. So just send me an email. I will buy you this book. It is so essential for our profession. If you have any orders in the next month through Botanical Biohacking, just write in Healing with Poisons in the order, and I just bought you this book. So thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Thank you so much for your the long time that you've spent on this project. And I'm really excited to see how this can benefit our industry, both in China and in the United States. And thank you for uh, this opportunity and to share my knowledge of poisons and medicines with uh, your audience, particular practitioners, and also really you know, help me to uh, uh, promote my book and sharing the knowledge to the larger world. I hope it's just useful information uh, uh, and not just understanding Chinese medicine, but Chinese culture and history is all embedded. And we we can't separate the two part. And that's as, as a person who, uh, who, who have multiple backgrounds, I really want to be that sort of ambassador to bridge different group of people to have a meaningful conversations. So this is a really great opportunity for me to, to do that. So thank you. Thank you so much. And is there anything else that I've failed to ask that you would like to add? Um, I think, no, I think that's, that'll be all. Yeah. Okay. So um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so next much. time when you think about poisons, you know, think differently. That's that's my hope. <laughs> you know, so absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liu.